Good evening, I'm Tara Swerzy. You, uh, we will answer a lot of those um, admin questions in just a moment. So thank you all for joining us tonight on our Strider Professional Development Webinar. Uh, we have these monthly on a variety of different topics throughout the equestrian industry that have been of interest to the various professionals and uh, aspiring professionals that are um, throughout the industry, both in dressage, hunter jumper, Western, um, eventing, you name it, um, we've been talking about it. So tonight we're gonna be talking on uh, hiring in the horse world and also really talking on a strategic level on what the, what the status of the industry is as far as the workforce, um, options for the workforce, options to get the workforce sustainable, uh, make sure that we've got hiring options moving forward. Uh, we've got Margaret McKelvey from Mythic Landings. She's the president of Mythic Landings, which is a communications and business enterprise based out of Maryland. She's going to be facilitating the discussion tonight with our panelists. Uh, if you've not yet had a chance to work with Margaret, take a look at her bio, take a look at her website. Uh, she works with every business in the horse world, every discipline. Uh, she's got a wealth of experience on staffing and uh, issues in the workforce around the horse world. So she is really a perfect person to be kicking off the discussion tonight. Uh, we also have London Gray who's joining us. Uh, you may know her most recently as Dressage for Kids, but you also probably know her from her riding career, uh, multiple Olympic rider, top trainer, uh, world-class educator, passionate about developing riders and giving people access to the dressage world. She's also um, occasionally moonlighted as an eventer back in the day. Um, and she's got a wealth of experience in things like Latin, Greek, and archaeology, um, just to make her a very well-rounded person. Uh, Will Baudry is joining us from the eventing world. Uh, he's going to be a bit jet-lagged because he's just done some top performances at Badminton and Rolex. So make sure you catch some of that stuff on YouTube. Uh, but he'll be speaking to us from the eventing world and sharing some of his experiences. He was also the coach of Area 5 Young Riders. I think we've got some of you actually on this webinar right now listening to him. So he's front and center on developing the workforce and developing the young professionals. And last but most certainly not least, we've also got Cheryl Sotherby out of Rolling Acres Farm. She's the show manager and trainer at Rolling Acres. Um, she's also an R Hunter judge, an equitation judge, a United States Hunter Jumper Association certified trainer. She has been working with um, both young and um, experienced professionals for years. She's got a wealth of experience on the Florida circuit, the Northern circuit, uh, really some great insights into developing the workforce, developing young riders, staffing various positions. Uh, so with that, um, admin stuff, as you listen to everyone speak and you have questions, Natasha Springers Levine, our chief operating officer, is going to be handling the Q&A. So you can either put them in the chat or you can use the Q&A function that's over there in the lower right on your Zoom thing to just send them on over to her. She'll be compiling them and then running through the Q&A after the discussion is finished. So uh, with that, without further ado, Margaret, thank you so much for joining us tonight and over to you. Great. Well, thank you all for being here and Strider for putting this on. Um, so the basis for this conversation is that as I'm sure everyone here knows, is that hiring and retaining a team is becoming increasingly difficult, I think, over the past few years. I've noticed one of the things that I do for my clients is I review resumes um, for job openings, and there's just been a lot fewer resumes for me to review um, recently. And so I thought that this was just Kind of a discussion that we needed to start having as to why and what can we do about it. Um, but to get things started, I wanted everybody to just quickly introduce themselves um, so that we know a little bit about yourself and your business and as that relates to our conversation. So, Lendon, I was going to start with you. Um, you know, you're an icon in the dressage world and your dressage for kids program is so very popular. And so I was wondering, how did you get attracted to that um, developing the horsemanship and the young professionals? And, you know, where do you see that going? Well, I, I was as a professional developing a lot of kids towards the North American championships every year. And I, became aware somebody I grew up through pony club I was in pony club at age seven and 
went through the whole thing and became a national examiner, the whole pony club route. And, uh, but I was noticing, and I was as guilty as anyone that very often I was in a situation and I saw other trainers doing the same thing where you were training that rider on that horse to do those tests. And that was really the education that was being put out there. And as a pony clubber with such a strong background in all of the horse mastership, I was getting more and more depressed about the fact that I was seeing less and less um, horse mastership coming from these kids. And so in 1998, with the help of Fern Feldman, we decided to put on a show where um, the riders, it was three phases, they do a dressage test, all of the levels, but also a group equitation class and then a written test on assigned reading. And every year um, the re the, we, we assign different books. So, and, and now the show has expanded considerably. It's a three day to do with uh, quite a bit of, of educational part of it and stable management part of it in that show. So that's, that's what got Dressage for Kids started. And then as it, over the years, we've been able to, the way I look at it, fill in the blanks. If we, something that sort of needs to be done for the young people in Dressage, we try to offer it. But that's how it got started was because we were seeing less and less all around education. Awesome. Um, so, Will, you have a wealth of experience in the eventing world, um, including numerous um, international competitions. I was wondering if you could share your professional background and how that helped segue you into your professional career and your business. Um, yes, I, um, I did the, the typical graduated high school and um, looked for a working student program. I think those are, um, you know, the amazing opportunities in that. I was very lucky that I got, um, you know, that I ended up, I was working student at Philip Dutton's barn. Um, and um, I really believe what you know, I learned a lot from Philip, mm -hmm. obviously, um, riding wise, but what I took more out of as I got older and, and uh, had my own barn was really the, the, the horsemanship side of it and the management of the horses and the village that it took to run that operation that I was a part of. And so that was one of the big things that I took from that. Um, in 2000, 2003, I did um, the, I, I did, I did Kentucky, um, now uh, five star, it was long format then, and ended up getting shortlisted and um, subsequently riding on the Pan American team that year um, and ventured out on my own. Um, I was 21, um, so I, I got very lucky. Um, in in that respect that I rode on a senior team at such a young age I went you know from young riders right onto the team and that really gave me a, a springboard into a professional career but um, I, I got some really good advice from some icons in the sport um, you know one being Karen Stives that told me after I competed at the world games in Aachen in 06 she said don't expect the next horse to fill his shoes and I, I, I think I owe my 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 career to that, you know, seven second comment. Um, because, you know, I had success early on, gave me a springboard onto that career, but it's you don't just hit the springboard and go flying through the air through the air. You gotta hit the the you know, the pommel horse first. And so I um ventured out on my own uh after the Pan Ams in two thousand and three and ultimately ended up in Southern Pines, North Carolina. Um rented farms for a bit there and ended up buying my current Gavilon farm, which is just south of Southern Pines in 2008 and have worked, you know, really hard over the last, you know, 15 years to develop this into a top training facility so that I can keep producing horses to the top of the sport. 
Awesome. And we will delve more into that. Um, so Cheryl, as the show manager for one of the top hunter jumper barns um, on the East Coast, you, I think the one, two things I wanted to touch on with Rolling Acres so that everyone knows they're literally around the corner from me. So I, I know their program a bit um, is one, you guys are quite large, you know, it's a large program with over 50 horses um, and you travel a lot. Um, and so can you just share a little bit about your background, how you became part of the Rolling Acres show stables family and, you know, how what managing such a large operation is like um I started as a customer at Rolling Acres um when I graduated high school I started working at a corporate job while I went to college uh and I also horse showed uh, as an amateur so I finished college I was at my corporate job and I was like okay this is the time of my life if I'm going to go do it I'm going to try it now so I can go back so um, I was lucky enough to fill a position at Rolling Acres where I had already been a customer. So I kind of knew their program pretty well. Um, and there, there were a couple of managers that I, that were managing the barn while I was a customer that I learned a lot from. I've been taking care of my own horses since I was 13 years old. So, you know, my mom, you know, different people like that, you just kind of learn, um, you know, the ropes on general horsemanship, um, so I started working at Rolling Acres. I started working as a groom. And then very quickly, the manager we had at the time moved on to another position. So I kind of was like, okay, here I am. Um, and it's been a lot. I mean, it's been a lot over the past few years to learn, but we have a great group of people. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Nicholson own the farm, Patty and Mary Lisa, um, their daughters uh, train and ride. So like it's a whole, it is literally a family operation. I'm kind of a non-blood sister at this point. Um, I've been the, uh, working there for 20 years. I was a customer for probably mm -hmm. seven or eight years prior to that. Um, we do have, the farm is 200 acres and we do have like 60 horses on the farm. They all aren't show horses. Probably 50 of them are show horses. Um, and we do travel a lot. We show a lot, but because we have so many, we don't show the same ones every week. So we are going to horse shows every week, but we're not taking the same horses. Um, so we have a great staff that's at home to supplement. Um, you know, they do all of the stuff at home, getting us ready, getting the next horses ready, getting all the equipment ready. So, you know, when we turn around, we come home on Sunday, we leave on Tuesday morning. Um, the home staff has a lot of stuff ready for us and then we get to the horse show set up with our normal guys we have a group of guys that stay home and do all of the barn work and maintenance and everything at home we have a group of guys that stay on the road um so it's just kind of routine now uh i mean our normal horse show is between i mean 15 horses showing is a small horse show for us we're usually a little over 20 um and i mean we have we've done it for so long we're organized we have a lot, a lot of uh, family situation, um, so it's not really that hard. It's just, you know, kind of what we do. I like that you just said it's not that hard. I'm sure everyone. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> once you get a routine, right? Once you get a routine, it's just kind of, you know, what we do. Yeah. Um, so I want to dive right in, and one of the things that I wanted to ask each of you about was. Where do you see the most critical gaps in the equestrian workforce today? Is it basic horsemanship? Is it maybe like the poor working conditions that people are like running away from? Um, a diminishing work ethic? I know that pops up in social media a lot. Um, or is there just a lack of a clear career pyramid? Um, so. Lendon, you know, I know your program's renowned for the emphasis on horsemanship. What what do you think about what's going on right now? Well, as I said before, I think there is a definite lack in, in the overall uh, education of the riders. And I, I have riders in my program from barely training level to through Grand Prix. And just as an example, the winter program, which is a three-month program, I have 12 to 15 kids in Florida. 
for three months. And uh, one of the things that happens is they have reading assignments and they have tests all the time. And about the second or third year, it's been going on for 10 years now, I thought, well, okay, I'm gonna make the first test really easy. I'm gonna give them a test on parts of the horse. I mean, everybody knows parts of the horse, right? I was horrified and continue to be horrified that these very capable young people up through their early 20s don't know the basic parts of the horse. And that's a little scary to me because I think I knew the parts of the horse when I was you know, six or seven years old. I could have, I could have uh, uh, done well on the test that I give them. So um, I think I see, and I've, I've been seeing this for, for years, quite a few years now, I would see more and more of the young people that I work with uh, come out of, say, doing young riders. I mean, the, those that are capable, um, and they go right into becoming professionals. And they don't go through, for example, the working pro working student program that I think most people used to go through in one way or another. And um, so you get these young people that are becoming professionals very early, they don't have the background and then they're not passing it on to others. Um, and then another thing that I, I see in the overall care, when I was growing up and you know, I'm, I'm old here, um, we didn't have all of the vet care immediately available. And we had to figure out and really be very careful of our horses uh, in a way that it seems now, oh, he has a pimple, let's call the vet. Um, and so the people don't educate themselves. They're letting the vets do it. They're letting the feed people do it. And that's fantastic that these people are available. But I think a lot of the riders are relying on these people rather than educating themselves, Does that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so Will, you, you shared that you did the working student thing. You've done young riders. I believe you've coached young riders too. Okay. Um, do you think it's a simple answer of people are getting burnt out or there's not this economic, like if you just waved a magic economic wand and was able to double everyone's salary, do you think that that you know, has anything to do with it and that step from young riders to professionals? Um, I think, you know, I think it's a case by case scenario in a lot of instances. Um, I think, you know, I, to me, one of the biggest things that I think gets missed and that I see a lot in people that come to me and, or, um, you know, I'm, a lot of people come to me for help in it for fitness for the horses um and the the lack of understanding of the of the of the fitness is something that um I, I, it, it, not just in the fitness but the lack of understanding the lack of leadership is something that i think is is really missing um in a lot of uh, you know uh, young riders that go from young riders that go maybe to a working student program and then they go out on their own and um, there's that lack of leadership and there's that sorry there's a helicopter I live right by Fort Bragg <laughs> um, I feel like fly right over my house um, and uh, sorry um, but, but so I think that there's a huge lack of leadership um and then, um, you know, like I was saying, going back to what I was saying about Philip, my my time with Phillips, at when I was there, his head groom um, was a girl by the name of Colby Saddington, and um, she's a dear friend of mine. I'm actually one of her kids' god godfathers, and um, it, yeah, you know, she ran a, a tight ship, and nothing nothing got missed, and. Um, you know, and, and then all, one of the biggest things that I, that I take away and I really implement my program now is um, it, it, to, to echo what um, was just said about the, 
you know, just because a hair is out of place, you don't need to call the vet. Have some horsemanship. Start to know your horse. Feel feel their legs. Know it. Of course, there's a time to call a vet, and there's a time to do that. But there, you have to take responsibility. And when you don't know, you have to be able to say, "I don't know." And I think that's a big thing that that, especially with social media, I hate mm. social media. Um, but people are so afraid to say, "I don't know." And that's something that I think you have to be able to stick your hand up and say that and, and, (laughs) and be humble about um, being teachable. You have to be teachable. And um, so I think that, you know, you know, people talk about the money and they talk about, look, none of us are getting rich in horses. If you want to do that, take up tennis. You do it for the love of the game and you do it for the love of the horse and you do it for the, 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 the partnership and the relationship you have with these animals that give us their lives. And that needs to be the, the priority, not how much money am I going to make? One of my biggest pet peeves is when somebody comes to interview for a working student. The first thing they ask me is how many days off do I get? As many as you want, because you're not getting hired. <laughs> and if you gotta you have to be obsessed with doing this sport and obsessed with this world and if you're not obsessed with it go do something else because it is it is hard work and it is heart ache and when it goes right and it may only go right once every four years but that one 30 seconds of success makes it all mm-hmm. worth it and if that's not going to be enough pick a different career So Cheryl, the hunter jumper world is um, admittedly a little bit foreign to me. Um, And I know that you guys have had, you know, dozens of young riders come through, through your program. What is it that you think sends a young rider on one path to becoming a professional rider or saying, nope, this isn't for me? Um, I think that Will is right on the mark. It's passion. Um, you know, even for educating yourself, like if you're passionate about horses, like we all are, you're going to read every book you can get. You're going to read every magazine. You're going to, you know, listen to interviews. You're going to stand at the schooling area and watch training. You're going to watch schooling. You're going to do all of those things. And, and I definitely think that that is something that's hugely overlooked. You can't just be a professional and just, it sounds like Will kind of stole my thunder that uh, I totally agree with what he's saying. This is this, we do this because we love horses. We are not getting rich. You know, we, we are lucky that we get to make a living off animals that we absolutely love, but there are some nights when you have a sick horse and you're at the barn all night, you don't get a day off. You don't get an hour off and that has to be okay. The horse has to come first. You have to know the parts of the horse. You have to know basic vet care you have to know those things and I just I don't think I think that so many people now they just want to say I ride horses and I jump jumps and that's great and I got this ribbon and here I am and that's fine if that's your hobby and you know but if you want to be a professional you want to go down that road you you have to do it because you love it and you have to you have to learn 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 you have to follow you know um, will mention having a great barn manager. Like you have to watch the people that do a good job. You have to watch the FBI groups. You have to watch the riders. Um, you have to want to learn it on your own, pick up everything that you can. And that I think makes the difference between a rider that just goes to win a ribbon and somebody who actually wants to be in the business. And, and one, no, one I, other, I'm, oh, go ahead. You no, know, one other thing I was, I just thought of um, what she was talking, you got to sit on a lot of horses. A lot of people, you know, again, back to the social media thing, they see that, you know, Susie Q down the street got this new German horse and it's an amazing jumper. And, you know, I only have this off the track thoroughbred. I mean, or I only have this. I don't have the money to get that horse. It doesn't matter. You know, one of my biggest mentors and, and people, someone who I look up to a lot, Laura Kraut, she says all the time, the amount of horses, I mean, she'd go down to the, and I, I would do the same thing. You know, you go down, you go to the barn and you just sit on whatever you can. That's how you learn feel. That's how you learn what feels right. Not just, 
yes, I love the expression, good horses make good riders, because, you know, it, you end up, you develop a style of riding and a style of teaching, and regardless of a, the, the longer you're a professional, funny, a lot of times you watch a professional, at least in my sport, like you look at all my horses, and they all kind of go the same. They're all very different, but they all kind of go the same. Boyd's are the same way. Lauren Keepers are the same way. We all have a way of training and developing horses, but you have to sit on a lot of horses to be able to navigate your style. One thing I was just going to add, not that I'm a professional rider, but even for the young riders is when you do have to have your vet out or your farrier out, don't be afraid to ask them questions. Right. You know, a, a lot of times I think people are afraid to ask their vet a question of like, all right, well, why, what can I do in the future? Same thing with um, my farrier, you know, my joke is I get to ask one neurotic question per farrier visit, but you know, it just adds to your toolbox, you know? And so I, and I know that at least the vets and farriers I work with are always happy to answer, answer questions and they don't know why people are scared, you know, to ask them. Um, all right, moving on. Um, you all have decades of experience and wow, what is your impression of the trend over the past 10 or so years? Do you think things are getting better? Do you think things are getting worse? Do you think that with social media, things are just a lot more public? Um, so I don't know who wants to tackle this one as to, you know, just some trends that you're seeing over the past decade. One of, one of my favorite expressions is you're either with the times or you're not. And, you know, sports and, and, horse care and veterinary care and farrier and equipment it's all it's ever changing and you've got to grow grow with it one of my biggest pet peeves is when I hear people say well in my day well in your day you do you did exactly what was the best in your day of course but things evolve and change and I think you have to grow with the sport you have to be able to say I don't know and I want to learn better and um so I think that's one of the trends that I, I, I see, you know, you got to, it has to be open dialogue. And I, I see a lot of people kind of um, stuck in, in one way and, and not, not open to change and not open to, um, to new ideas and all that. At the end of the day, the horsemanship has to come first, but they're, they're, it's, it's ever changing. Lendon, you mentioned that your show went from one day to now it's this three day affair. Mm -hmm. I would assume that's a good thing. Um, but, you know, what have you seen, you know, change in the participants over the years? Well, it's interesting. The show went, you know, over a period of years, it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to where it got too big and we the, the, we said okay the next year we're going to have to limit the entries and then the last few years it's cut back and there we're not sure exactly why but there are those for example that are not willing to come to the show because of the written test because they have to do some reading and it's one third of their overall score. You know, the person that goes in with their fancy horse and gets a fabulous dressage score, well, if they can't also do the equitation nicely and if they don't study for the written test, they don't win and they're not, they're not happy I love that. about that. Um, another thing that I, I find, it, you know, you, you read today that the young people, I don't mean horse people, but young people in general don't know how to be bored. You know, they have to be on something, doing something. And for example, I learned so much when I first got serious about dressage by sitting hours in the arena and watching training, just sitting, not even thinking so much, just sitting and letting it ooze in. And, you know, we're down in Wellington and I'll, I'll say, come on, you guys have got an hour or two to spare. Why don't you go watch the warmups at Global at the, at the CDI, at the dressage shows? And, you know, they wanna do something else. Um, and that, that willingness, it, you know, you all have covered it a little bit as well of, 
to to soak up in any way that you can the knowledge that's out there so that you are truly educated in all areas um they're just they want to be doing something else they're they're happy to do their lessons and, and i've got kids that work so hard but when that free time comes rather than use it to uh inc improve themselves as a horseman they're going to do something else I think parents also have a part in that. You know, we have kids that every day of the week, their parents have something scheduled for them. They're playing tennis one day, they're rowing one day, they're playing soccer another day, they're coming to ride. And that's great. And that makes you well rounded, but you're not going to be an expert at all of those things if you don't, if you can't, you know, when we were kids, we went to the barn and we rode every horse we could sit on and we brushed them and we played with them in the fields and you learn behavior, you know, you learn all those things. And we, the parents, at least in, in my situation, a lot of the parents just want their kids to do 400 things and don't really let them, even if they have start to show passion about it, they're already, already doing something else. Uh, there, you know, and then it comes time for, okay, it's, it's exam time. It's SAT time. It's okay. We're touring, you know, colleges like there's, they, they never have a chance to sit and be bored, which is a perfect example, but be bored at the barn, petting your horse, watching him in the field, you know, playing with the, the other horse. Um, there's, there's just so much going on that they don't just sit down and take a minute and figure out why they love it or if they really love it or learn something. Um, so, all right, let's try talking solutions. <laughs> so, you know, in every, every industry, there's a career pyramid, whether it's functional or efficient, there's usually is kind of a clear, a clear path. Um, and, you know, we've touched on the working student pathway. And so that is a career pyramid. Um, in the equestrian world, you know, farriers have apprentices, vets have interns. What do you think are some things that we can do to identify and strengthen this career pyramid so that it becomes something that people think is possible, you know? Well, you know, in, in Europe, to become a professional in many of the European countries, you have to go through an apprentice program and you have to pass tests <clears throat> and become certified if you want to use that word um uh, and except i think in the state of massachusetts anybody can hang out a shingle and uh be a professional so there's no pressure to um maybe that's the wrong word but anyway uh, to get all of, all of that education and you know one thing we've discovered and and i was very active for many many years in the u.s dressage federation and how often we would offer educational programs and not enough people would would take take the opportunity to do it. So, um, you know, we can offer that education, but the young people also have to want to do it unless there's something out there that makes them, that requires them to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cheryl, is in the hunter jumper world, is there, I know there's a lot of um, the rules for amateurs, you know, and your children's, you age out and stuff. How much do you think that is good? Do you think it, it hinders people becoming professionals because they want to stay more competitive in the amateur status? I don't, I can't really tell you a situation where that is actually an issue. Okay. I know there are a lot of people that want to stay amateurs and, you know, they want to teach up down lessons or, you know, some things like that. I don't know of a lot of scenarios where that's actually a problem. I think the problem is like wanting to be a professional you know like a lot of the kids you know when they turn 18 they go to college now we have great um ncea programs like we have great college riders but then they think they go you know ride on a team they're great on a team they go to a horse college they're great at college and then they think they come out and okay i'm a professional now 
when they forget about all of the bottom stuff. And I don't necessarily think that the school is actually teaching them, okay, no, you have to do A, B, and C before you think you want to be a professional. You might be able to go in and ride and put on a performance, but there's 7 million other things. Um, so the aging out and the amateur, I don't think is so much the problem. It's just missing the whole, the whole basic bottom of the pyramid that you're talking about they you know the kids think that they're going to come out of school they're going to and now they're a professional they don't have all of the bottom layers well with you i know you have some working students you mentioned you have working students do you have your program have you had working students that went on to become employees for you or kind of did that stepping stone at, at another farm? We um, actually don't. Are you referring to me? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I was asking Will, but if you- oh, Okay, perfect. Sorry. I was, I was confused. <laughs> um, I, I, have, I have had working students. I actually have one girl that um, was, started as a working student and I ended up hiring her, hiring her um, five years ago and she's kind of my second rider. So when I'm gone, she, she does a lot of the riding. Um, I've had working students come out of my program that are now, you know, starting their young professional careers. Um, one thing I say really often to working students when they ask me about being a professional and being a career, I say, I, I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> um, and I think that, that I, that's something that 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 work that's how I, I look at my career and I'm always learning you know we talk about the pyramid scheme I'm still on the base level I've got a really long base level right now because I've been doing it long enough but you know until I you know all I all I've done is my competitive resume um, and my coaching resume so okay maybe you know the the pyramid you know I've got two levels there but it takes years and years and years to become that you're never a master. You're always learning with horses and you're always, you're always becoming better. As I said earlier, you're, you're growing with the sport because it's ever changing. And um, so I think that's something that I, I really try to uh, pass on to students of mine uh, or people that come to me for, for advice or help where they're starting out is, you know, um, you can, you know, in our, in our, in my world, we don't have, you know, amateur versus professional, um, so to speak. So, you know, we don't have those sort of classes, but, um, you know, uh, I, I just think you've got to constantly be open to learning. And, um, I mean, I've learned things from working students. And so I think if you, if I, I try to really, that's how I, how I have, I, that's how I believe I've had a career for as long as I've had. And that's what I really try to show the people that come into my program. And I think if I can add, I think I see now working students, they sort of want to do it for a year or two. When I, I haven't had a working student program now for 13 years, but the, the working so the people that started with me as very basic riders of working students and one ended up going to the Olympics and the Pan American Games and those that are now very, very successful Grand Prix riders, they were with me for years and they started, you know, sweeping floors and hacking horses and, and getting, getting a, a little bit of help in their riding every day, but not, not wildly so. And then they gradually built their, their way up to where they were riding more and then training and then starting a little business within my business where they would get certain clients and some of them became the stable manager and but they were there for many years before they went out on their own and when you look at two of our top dressage riders Catherine Bates and Chandler and and Adrian Lyle who were working students and then grooms for their uh Olympians uh, and they were with them for years before they got their opportunity. And everything's got to be quick now. Yeah. You know, I've, I need my horse. I, I, we have a, Dressage for Kids has a, a horse donation program. We get, we get horses donated to us 
uh, that then we lease out. And so the kids apply if they want a horse and everybody wants, I need, uh, you know, I just did young riders. I need an under 25 Grand Prix horse. Can you help me find an under 25 Grand Prix horse? Not, can you help me find a horse that I can ride and learn on and develop? Uh, I need a young rider horse. I need an under 25 horse. Not, I need to have an opportunity to learn more. And I see that so much. What would you guys say to the parents of the young riders, you know, that I think there's a lot of pressure of, well, you need, you need to make money. How are you going to feed yourself? How are you, you know, um, where in any other industry you're starting out as an intern, you know, is there, do you guys have any ideas how to bridge that gap between corporate America viewing viewpoint and the equestrian world reality? That's a tough one for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, it, that, that's a, that is a tough one, but I, I would have, you know, if you go back to the, you know, the perception versus the reality, and that's something that in, in my world, I, I've dealt with, um, you know, working students, that have left or just students in general that you know they get a horse and then you know for whatever reason it, you know, it doesn't work and then the parents come to me and um or it does work and the parents come to me and they're like well we want another one and you know you have to have the the the, the biggest conversation i have with parents is um I, I always tell them that they need to learn to uh, accept and not expect if they're going to support their child in this endeavor, because there's going to be a lot of things that may, that hit you blindsided. And I think that's the biggest thing that I tell parents all the time. And one other thing that's slightly related is why are we not proud to be a groom? or the trainer of young horses. Absolutely. You know, in, in Europe, the trainers of young horses, for example, are so admired. Um, yeah. Here, we've got to be doing, you know, the, the top level, whatever, whatever your sport is. And um, if we could somehow encourage people or to help people to understand that being a groom is a fabulous job. I mean, if you love horses, yeah, the hours are long and so on and so forth, but the relationship you build up with the horses and the same as the trainers with, of young horses, um, it's a, it can be a very, very positive way to go. Absolutely, and I, I wanna add to that. So I competed at badminton last week and um, I, in our world, or, you know, in the eventing world, the, the grooms in this country there, um, and, and all over the world, there's, there's a huge camaraderie um, between the grooms and the riders. And a friend of mine who's a groom, um, she's a freelance groom um, in England, and she, um, another professional rider, an Australian guy, he had two horses competing at Babington, and I hadn't seen Deb's um, in a couple of years, actually, with COVID and everything. Um, and she climbed Mount Kilimanjaro last year, so I didn't see her at all last year. But um, I said, oh, my God, you know, good to see you. What are you doing here? And she was like, oh, you know, Bill called and asked if I would step in. He's got this new girl that, you know, she's only been with him for two months, but he's got two horses here, and it's her first time badminton. And she said the coolest thing to me. She was like, she goes, yeah, I couldn't believe that this girl just got a grooming job and eight weeks later gets to go to badminton. I mean, stuff that we dream about for years. And it was such a cool <laughs> thing for to hear her say that. Um, the girl that worked, Christina, who works for me, who um, we're going on almost 11 years now, it was the first time Christina had done badminton. And the excitement and the, and the joy um, that that the grooms get in, in my in our world it's so cool to see that and then the big events do really awesome things like if your horse started cross country 
the organized gave every groom 200 pounds cash that they could go and use in the trade fair or wherever they wanted. And so the, the, it was, it was so cool to, for me to hear Deb say that about this girl. Like I, like she, you know, I, she's re- a really funny lady. But she's like, yeah, I, you know, I was telling her that this is the stuff dreams are made out of and you got here in eight weeks. So there's going to be a lot of people that are jealous of you. And so I, I, I think that I, we have to uh, highlight that and talk about that. And it is, I mean, trust me, horses, they've taken me all over the world and the, and I'm very lucky. The girls that, that have worked for me, I've got Jamie who's been here five years, Christina's going on 11 and Nat's going on 14. And I have a great group of, of girls and we, um, I think we, I think we need to highlight that and, and talk about it. And it's, it's a lot of fun because trust me, Saturday morning at badminton, I was really wishing I was a groom and not having to go out there and jump that crap because I was pretty nervous. <laughs> I think that um, hopefully something that's going to spotlight what we're talking about. I'm sure you guys have seen the picture of the groom of um, the winner of the Kentucky Derby that there's really kind of been a lot, you know, going around about how much he loves his horse, how he was with his horse and the like real sweet picture of him kissing his horse. Um, so I'm hoping that maybe that's going to change a little bit and make people um, understand more that grooms are not, I mean, grooms are huge. Like they, they're huge in your horse care. They're huge in getting to where you want to be. Um, they, they know your horses better than you do sometimes. So um, hopefully that's going to, going to shed some light on, what is considered a lower level position, which is really not. <laughs> uh, yeah. May I ask I, I Will, Will a question? Sure. Is it all right if I ask Will a question? Um, Will, it's fabulous how long your staff has worked for you. Why? What do you do to keep them happy? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, Nat, who has, is my barn manager, um, She's actually, she worked, she helped me for the first time 20 years ago in 2002. She, she groomed for me at um, Foxhall and then she, she freelanced for a bit, worked for Philip and stuff. And then she's been with me since I've been here um, in 08. And um, I, we have a, 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 a fun environment. The, you know, I, I, I don't have a whole lot of rules, but my number one rule is the horses come first. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we work hard, we really stick, try to stick to a schedule. But one thing that I, I try to do for my girls is it's very easy to get, you know, I have the expectations of the way the barn gets left and the brass needs to be polished and the, but it's not a obsessive, you know, it's not, um, it's. I, I give them their space and I, my job is to come into the barn and ride and train horses and teach lessons. And that's my job. Nat's job is to manage the barn. I'm not going to nitpick her and oversee stuff. And this isn't getting done. And this isn't getting done. That's not my job. She's hired to do that job. Christina is grooming my horses. So she she knows their legs and she knows every nick and scrape and she'll get me or she'll get Matt. But I don't, I think one of the biggest things that I get told anyway is um, that I let the girls do their jobs and let them be proud of their jobs because if they're proud of their jobs, they're going to do their job. And if, if I see a lot of professionals and friends of mine, I, I, I I I'll, I can joke around with this. She's one of my dear friends and she was here this winter and she's really struggling with employees. And she's like, I don't know how you keep them. And anyway, she was, re- she was staying in my house and she was late coming, coming back. I was having dinner one night and I said, what took you so long? And she goes, I was uh, sweeping the, the walker and getting the muck keep out. And I said, we do that on Wednesdays and Sundays. Now, granted, I only have, five or six horses that go on it every day so if more horses are on it and it needs to be done more frequently I don't even have to ask it gets done more frequently but this friend of mine said you only make them do it twice a week I would make those girls do it every evening and I said that's why I have people that work for me and you don't Mm -hmm. and 
you know, it, it's the, it, we laughed about it and she was like, all right, you know, touche. But you, you have to hire people to do a job. I expect the job to be done. If the job isn't done, then there's going to be consequences, but I'm not going to hover over them and, okay, you're doing that right, or you're doing that wrong, or I want this done this way. I'll say something, you know, this horse needs to, do, I want to try a different back, back pad. Okay, what do you want? I let the girls do their jobs. I think that's why, you know, and I, you know, I, it, it, yes, there's long hours and there's some like Christina, who's actually in New York right now because she flew back with Mason. She landed uh, this afternoon. I mean, she hasn't had a day off in a month. She hasn't complained about it, but I told her, I said, she goes, well, I'll get, I'm going to land in there. He's got to be in quarantine and then he's going to be picked up on Friday. So I'll just wait, make sure he gets into quarantine or gets on the trailer and then I'll get a, um, well, first she was like, I'll just fly, fly home the day I land. And I said, well, why don't you camp out in a hotel up there and maybe go into the city and do something for fun for a couple of days. And, you know, I think you have to, I don't know. I, you have to, I have to you know, I respect their, their careers because it's their careers that enable me to have a career and I let them do their careers. So. I think that I've been seeing some questions coming in. Um, so before, cause I know that this is, I call it twilight hour for horse people. Um, so uh, I think we want to just snag um, a few of those questions from Natasha before we wrap up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there have been really good questions coming in. Um, and thank you all for a super discussion. It's really interesting to hear from so many different parts of the industry. I think everybody agrees. Um, so one great question that came in was, what are the top sort of two to three professional skills that you would want people who are coming to work for you to sort of have? outside of horsemanship like is there anything in particular that you look for with regards to time management or accounting or even communication anything like that that's really really important in an employee um and we can start with cheryl for that one um i would say uh being responsible like i want you there every day on time i don't want to have to you know wonder where you're at um, and I think that goes a little bit with passion. Like if you, if, you know, I'm always early to the barn because I want to get there. I want to make sure my horses are looking good. You know, I want to check all that stuff out. I expect somebody else to be the same way. I expect them to want to be there, want to do the job, be ready to do the job. Yeah. Yeah. Lendon, is there anything that you sort of outside of the horsemanship piece, which you've, we've talked about a lot, um, really like to instill in people? Well, anyone that I would have working for me, I need to know that they really love the horses. Yeah. And if they, if they do that, then they're going to pay attention to detail. They're going to be willing to take the extra mile. It's, it's the ones that look at it just as a job um, that I'm, aren't going to last, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> you hope. And Will, I think you kind of, touched on this a little bit in talking about your relationship with your team. Um, but is there anything in particular that you're kind of, and you talked a, before a bit about that willingness to learn. Is there another little piece that, like that? Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, I, I'm not going to want to be here for somebody, you know, if, if you're going to come do, if you want to come do a job, great. I'm not going to, you know, chase after you. I'm not going to, I, I'm not going to want this for you. I, I want it. And so th there's that, but, um, you know, and, and being able to say, you know, I don't know. One of, one of the things um, that Nat uh, wants done in my barn as the barn manager is at the end of the day, all my horses live out at night and then the buckets get scrubbed and, they get washed and then they get put on the outside of the stalls and the the stalls get cleaned out and swept back and it's always really interesting like nat sweeps this very straight line and i always like christina within two days of being here 11 years ago 
she figured out I'm going to sweep that, that straight line. Jamie is the same way. And then I've had, you know, working, I can always tell which working, wh what students or employees are going to last or, and, and they don't, people that, that, if they don't sweep a straight line within two days of being there, and I don't have to say anything, nobody has to say anything. I can tell by that line. I can tell to that, are you, are you that detail? Do you, do you understand the detail that we're after? And to echo what Lyndon said about the love of the horse, because if you love the horse, you're going to pay attention to those details and not to keep quoting other things, but I, I had a, uh, my mom was a big competitive swimmer growing up. And she always said to us, my sister, my brother and I, that her coach Coach Gallicol said he could always tell the true champions were the one that put the soap back on the soap dish when they got out of the shower. And that's a really important phrase that I have really tried to live my life by. And, you know, you make your bed when you get out of it. And it's attention to detail. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also a little bit like in a team environment that mirroring and figuring out what the people who have lasted have mm -hmm. done. I think that's important too. Um, okay, so kind of switching gears, of, well, I guess it's all in the same family, but there was a great question that came in um, from someone who's been running a business for 35 plus years and has, no has noticed in the past five to 10, a really steep decline in young people wanting to learn and wanting to work, kind of what all of you guys touched on a little bit. Um, so is there maybe a couple of recommendations that you guys can share, if any, um, for finding and retaining barn workers? Um, Cheryl, do you have any insights on that one? Um, from a barn worker perspective, honestly, what we have, uh, we have a couple of families um, that they like, when we need help, they reach out and they, they help us find people to do uh, barn work. Um, and then they kind of hold each other accountable. So, you know, they're not going to call their friend to come work in the barn and then look bad because their friend's there. Um, that's actually our big, I mean, it's a problem still. Like right now, I actually have two spots that I need to fill. Um, and so, you know, we're reaching out trying to find, but we try to um, get our, the employees that currently work there to help us find people who they want to work with, who they know, who they've heard from friends, you know, word of mouth is huge for us to um, try to find additional workers in the barn. Um, grooms a little bit of that team building by default. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, you know, I'm, uh, we're kind of like, well, like I, my grooms have been, you know, one's been here 15 years, one's been here eight years, one's been here five years. Um, so I'm pretty lucky in that perspective that I haven't had to reach out and try to find grooming help. Um, but the actual, like, you know, taking care of the barn, the maintenance, the maintenance on the farm and that, um, we, we try to do like, you know, they help us find other people. I don't really have another Avenue. I know, I know of other people who have put, you know, ads in the paper, they've gone to you know, uh, the high school football coach to say, hey, are there any, you know, young boys, young men or women or anybody that want to come do this job? And it's a struggle to find people that want to do the physical work that we do. Um, so that doesn't really seem to be successful for us. It's the word of mouth that really helps um, us find help. Yeah. And Lendon, what um, I feel like you've probably put a lot of things into place in terms of networking through, you know, everybody that you've touched through dressage for kids. Like how, how does that sort of feed into everything? Uh, well, you know, I gave up having a stable 13 years ago, so I haven't had to hire anybody in a long time. But again, even, you know, I'm trying to educate the kids. I try to give them some direction, but they all want to ride you know, and they want to do as little of the other stuff as they can get away with. Yeah. So I, I'm no help here, but I, I have to, to uh, agree with Cheryl. When I did run a stable, uh, that was exactly how my grooms, you know, when I needed a new groom, oftentimes if a groom was leaving for something, he would bring somebody in. He knew somebody that wanted his job, but that was back in the day when more people wanted to work. Mm. Yeah. 
I have the 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 guy that he's a godsend. Um, he and his family live here on the farm, and they have a ha- uh, I have a house for he and his wife and their kids. And he is the my maintenance guy. And I I had had gone through a couple um, when I first got the farm. Um, and then Jose, he, he's another one that has been here since 2013. Um, and the biggest advice I could say about barn help is give them ownership. He's so, I've never asked him to do it, one thing, um, but he, see, he saw the detail that Nat keeps the barn and he take, has taken that detail to the gardens and, and to the um, gardens. I sound like I've got some estate, but to, you know, <laughs> the weed whacking around the arena to the, the, where I keep the jumps. It, it, he is so meticulous about doing that. And I'm so appreciative. And I, I tell him how appreciative, but I give him that ownership uh, of, of how beautiful he makes this place. And I think he, I think if you do that to people, um, you know, I, I, and I, if you, if you give them a little bit of, if you give them ownership and, and, and really acknowledge their, what they bring and not focus on what doesn't get done. Um, I think that's something that, that is, you know, yeah, that, you know, that, that's a, a, and, and you have to be able, you have to, you have to take care of them. Um, you know, we go back to that, you know, saying a groom is lesser of a position or the, a, a farm hand or a maintenance manager is a less of a, a position. You know, the, I, you got to have the same respect to the janitor as you do the CEO. And if you give, give these guys ownership of what they do and acknowledgement and, and, and recognition for, for what they do. I mean, Jose and he and his, his wife is like, well, I think we've got to go back to New Jersey because the schools are better up there. The public schools are better up there for the kids. And I'm like, all right, well then it looks like I'm putting your kids through private school. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you gotta be able, you, you gotta, uh, you know, work, you gotta, you know, meet them. You gotta do what you need to and give them ownership of, of, and, and recognition for what they do. Absolutely. Um, and that actually feeds pretty perfectly into the question that I was going to wrap up with, um, which is basically like, what, what can employees do better, um, to make, you know, the whole industry seem more appealing to the future workforce. Um, so yeah, we'll definitely gave a good tip on that one. I feel like that ownership is so important. And again, like back to your, you know, met comments before about not micromanaging people. I think that that's really important too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Lendon or Cheryl, do you guys have anything to add about what employees or employers can do to make their situations more appealing for potential employees? I, I think Will has covered covered it really well. Yeah. Um, you know the, yeah. I don't really have anything to add. I don't think. I agree. I, you just have to, you know, know your employees well enough to know their needs. You know, sometimes they don't even really want to ask for things like that. But it's like if you notice, you know, a situation and you're like, hey, let me help you out with that. That goes. That's huge. That goes so far. Yeah. Yeah. Staying a little extra past when you usually leave or something can go a really long way. Um, Well, cool. I think that was all of the Q&A questions. And I don't want to keep anybody on for too long. So with that, I'll pass it back to Margaret and Tara to kind of wrap up. So everyone, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I very much appreciate the discussion. Um, Thank you hugely to all the panelists for sharing your thoughts, your insights um your experiences uh, i know I, I speak for everybody who's been listening that i certainly learned a lot tonight um, i really appreciate you taking the time to join us and share everything um, everyone who's been watching us on facebook live uh, we had a fair audience on facebook live 
Uh, please contact our support team if you want the recording or want to share the recording. Everyone who um, signed up for the recording, you'll be getting an email to you in a couple days from our team, along with the contact information of all of our panelists. If you want to reach out to them directly um, and work with some of their programs, feel free to do that directly. Um, they all have great insights in the industry, wealth of experience. So again, um, go forth and, and you know do what you can do to make the industry a really productive place for everyone to work, an enjoyable place for everyone to work where there's a lot of laughter and smiles. So thank you.